Welcome, everybody, to the 2 Plus 2 Poker Cast presented by RunItOnce.com. This is PokerCast 458, but video PokerCast number one. Alongside, I'm your host, A. Schwartz, alongside Mr. Roscoe P. Coltrane. Hi. Nice to be on your show again. <laughs> and Mr. Terrence Chan. T. Chan, welcome to Montreal. This is this is confusing. I'm, I'm doing the PokerCast, but there are cameras around. Yeah. I, this, is, this, is, this is concerning and frightening, and I don't like it one bit. Well, you no. have an advantage. You don't have to suck in a gut. I got to like where there's a camera now. You don't have it. You got a six pack over there. I'm getting, you know, yeah, I've you, almost got a six pack. I don't think you should suck in. You get, you know, I've been reading a lot of breathing <laughs> stuff. You know, when you're breathing, you should have the big expanded belly. You know, you should uh, let it out. You know, yeah, exactly. Breathe with the big Own expanded it. belly. Own the cheese. Exhale burgers. all the way. You know, just, just <laughs> let good. yourself, let yourself be there. But Feel you know, good. you're, That's you're, awesome. you're a svelte. Almost a sub 200 pound man yourself now, so you know. Pretty happy down to uh, 201. That was the real motivation, right? It you, was, you, yeah. you, you knew the they were going to stick a GoPro on you. It was going to be bad. Uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned, PokerCast 458. Uh, we're going to do video this week. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, we can continue to keep this going. It's going to be difficult when we're always not in the same city, but uh, we're going to give it a try. It's a little bit more fun, interactive for uh, the people who listen to our show. Uh, it's also going to go to audio, so we're not going to just completely abandon our uh, regular format. We're going to be uh, producing the show in, uh, for, for, for the for tens the of thousands channel. of people who have absolutely no interest in seeing, in seeing our ugly faces. They don't want to see us. No, I mean, no. indeed. Um, today we're on the show. We're in Montreal. We're going to be joined by Rob Young uh, from Dust Till Dawn uh, Poker Room. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the success that uh, they had over there in Birmingham. I was uh, per- uh, corrected Birmingham. this week. It's Birmingham, not Birmingham. And Nottingham, and not Nottingham. Oh, sorry, it's Nottingham. Yeah, Nottingham. Yeah. Nottingham. Nottingham. Like 99% Just, of people who play poker play poker for the crack. They do. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, we're also going to be quickly joined by Matt Savage in a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about his social experiment uh, uh, tournament that he had down at the California State Poker Championships. The, 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 the one that is apparently the end of the world if you if you need to be on a cell phone yes. all the time. And uh, this. We'll, we'll talk to him, see how that went. Uh, how was your trip here? You, uh, we, we came out from Vancouver. You're going to be here for an extended period of time, yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's my first time in La Belle Provence, so uh, going to take advantage of it and check things out. Uh, always wanted to come to this here town and never had a, a good enough excuse to. So I'm glad I was able to this time do this year poker show, play in the largest poker tournament in the entire na- grand nation of Canada. So, yeah, I'm going to play this poker tournament, um, see in the sites, train at Win a million the, dollars? The Tri-Star our gym. I'm gonna. That would make the second half of the trip a lot more fun. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> just gonna go ahead and say that winning a million dollars, even if they're Canadian dollars, right? That'll still help. Like even even you're even fine if they are it. Canadian. So like, you train. You mentioned a uh, big MMA center in Montreal in French yeah. Canada, right? To uh, GSP, obviously, and uh, and you went and did a little training at at the gym the, here. The famed TriStar Gym. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Montreal was, uh, you know, sort of the home of MMA before MMA was even a big deal in Canada. Yeah, you know? man, <laughs> it was a lot more legal. Uh, it, well, it was legal here and not in a lot of other places before Canada, so it was established a lot sooner. So, yeah, TriStar Gym's been around forever. Couldn't miss the opportunity. I'm still recovering from a bit of a knee injury, but uh, I couldn't miss the ah. opportunity to check out that gym. So that was fun. Good, good. Um, uh, well, on my way to the airport, I, yeah. and this is sort of this ongoing thing we have on the show, uh, I was running on empty, and I thought, ah, you know what? I'll just make it a couple more blocks. Yeah, you only drive a gigantic truck with like a 25-liter <laughs> engine. That's all. That's I fine. managed to uh, run out of gas and ended up missing my flight. Uh, you so actually missed one, your flight. I did miss my flight. Wow. This one cost me. I missed it by like 10 minutes. I got yeah. to the airport, <laughs> and Ross was already checked in. He, we were on the same flight, and Ross was like, where are you? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm wow. trying to The off. funny thing was the night before Adam texted me, he says, I'll see you in the morning. And I was like, he's like, I'll be there at 10. And I said, I snapped, was like, I'll take the over. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he went way over. I went a little over, yeah. So I got there and to the airport, and I was behind about five people. And I, actually, if nobody was in line, I would have made it. But it was that five or ten minutes. So you had, so you actually like ran out of gas, like stalled your car on the road. I ran out of gas. I abandoned my car. Wow! <laughs> yeah, I completely abandoned on That's the wrong hardcore. on the wrong side of the road. Texted my wife and said, uh, "You better get over there. You got to come over and pick up the car." Yeah, wow. so she did, and uh, she because she knows what it's like to live with the dumbass. Uh, yeah, dumb. you ran it to zero. I did wow. run it to zero. This one cost me. So I had to take a cab. I called a cab. And that cab ended up costing me a hundred dollars. But then on the way, you I'm, live in the middle of Alberta. I live in the sticks, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm thinking on the way, I'm going. Well, wait a second. I just checked in to see how much parking would be for the week, and it was a hundred and forty dollars. Yep. 
So I think I might have saved money running out of gas <laughs> somehow or another. But I missed the flight, and yeah. there was a flight 35 minutes later. So yeah. I ain't getting enough. Pay the change. You know, there's feed. a lot. Of no, people. I didn't. I went to oh. standby. They didn't charge me. Oh, there there's a go. lot of people watching this show that are going. That's kind of person to say a toad so. <laughs> you know what? A toad so. But I save money, so I. I, I I'm, I'm well, but you didn't save time. So the, I mean, the whole point that you know we've always tried to make in terms of running your Why gas tank this. on low right. is is you don't want to be like overly conservative and be that guy who the second you hit the one quarter mark on the tank has to like pull into the vehicle like you right. know because that's the total knit thing because you end up spending too much time at gas stations because cumulatively life. over the yeah. course of a year you're going to make an extra what like dozen trips to the gas station which is going to cost you like an extra five minutes per trip yeah, so you're going to lose an hour or an hour, or two, yeah. hour or two over the year but you lost well over an hour did i so, yeah, I mean, I it think it was so. a 35 minute later a direct flight from Vancouver to Montreal. Was it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think well, I did okay. Uh, yeah, fair enough. But I mean, you had a little, you, you increased your stress levels a I little did, bit. I did, I so did. My wife's you, stress levels. Yeah, indeed, so sure. you, you kind of got closer to even. So the, the the key is always to like push it to the edge, but never quite get there. So right? uh, get into Montreal. What a facility this is. I've heard all about. Yeah, this uh, is amazing. This playground. blew my mind. Holy when it came mackerel. In. This place this, is 80 tables. It's massive. It's like walking into the commerce. It, it, the it, Amazon it, exactly room the feeling that I got was yeah the first time I walked into a big LA casino like the commerce and uh, except it's it's you know it's nicer it's decor you know high ceilings yeah. and stuff like that it's pretty cool uh, the, the environs aren't much to speak of it's actually like the first time you yeah. know you, you drive out of the city onto the uh, the native or the for, First Nations Reserve. I'm not sure. I don't remember. First Nations, question. yeah. Uh, the the reserve, and it's you know it's you know there's there's just like. I don't smoke cigarettes, and so there's not a lot. Of, <laughs> there's not a lot. A lot of smoke shops. There's a lot of smoke yeah. shops, and I don't really, you know, it's not really fireworks season, and you know, it's always uh, fireworks season. Yeah, Come on. Well, I mean, uh, you know. yeah, no, this is the famous Kanawake Reserve. Where in Canada, if you're Canadian, you know all about it. If you're older than 15, there was right. a riot here uh, oh, yeah. of many, many years ago. So right, that and and it, quickly. And even if you're an online poker player, you should know this as the place where the original oh, yeah. online that's poker just, that's servers where I was going. for Paradise Poker, for Poker yeah. Stars, I think maybe Party was eventually... They uh, all I were. Think they were all hosted uh, here on this very reserve because uh, of the laws here in Canada. They're they're different uh, f from the rest of Canada, so it was perfectly legal to set up the servers here and run your, your illegal offshore online gambling business. <laughs> online gambling <laughs> business, yes. <laughs> Uh, and they did that for many years before uh, the uh, the walls came crumbling down. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> offshore gambling website yeah, is slow on the draw today. That yeah. must be on page four. It was on, he, yeah. it's, it's the camera's making him nervous. Yeah. It's throwing him off. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I mean, I think some of them saw it on like they moved to Europe and places like the Isle of Man and right. Gibraltar and so on before that. But uh, you know, uh, yeah, this was this is the. We're in the birthplace of online poker. We are in the birthplace. It's, it's, we should induct Kanawaki into the Internet Poker Wall. <laughs> it fame. almost should be. I, I mean, agree. You like, know, the Kanawaki Reserve the, facilitated. The, the first uh, chief of Kanawaki that said, Joe like, Norton. hey, y'all y'all need to come over here and set up these computers. Right. <laughs> come yeah. on come on down here. That However guy, that works. That guy's on the wall. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're on the verge of a whole bunch of online stuff as well. So um, here at the tournament this week, we have a, a $5 million guaranteed prize pool. One million guaranteed for first, uh, Terrence. You're going to partake in this uh, event. I'm I'm not Absolutely. sure if I'm doing it yet, um, but uh, you're going to try and win your way in satellites, or you just direct by. You're, you're I mean, I I tried to play some satellites on party, and and you know like. It was so difficult for me to get money on party that I was never actually able to play, which is super unfortunate because I saw they were overlaying uh, like crazy. So some of the some of the satellites. Yeah, so I mean, I'm looking at like $500 buy-in satellites where they're only getting 60 people, but they're you know they've got like uh, you know what. They've got like a, a prize pool like that's 40k or 50k in the prize pool worth of seats, and it was just really unfortunate that I couldn't get um, in there. You Are you know, gonna play any here? I might play some here. It depends what time uh, we do we get done this year's show. But I plan to play tomorrow. Uh, play play flight one eight at noon tomorrow. tomorrow. So you know I've 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 already wired my money here. You're so I want to make sure that's the priority first. Um, before we started, they were doing. Uh, you could hear them out in the lobby because and you'll, you you recognize the sound from the World Series of Poker when they're doing. Uh, $500 uh, flips for, for a seat. So oh, yeah. Everybody, 
it's a $500 satellite, it's a $5,000 tournament, 10 guys sit down, and they do some combination of a flip. That was fun. The to best see thing ever for poker rooms. It's you so get great. to take rake on a juice. tournament that lasts 10 <laughs> yeah. minutes. And doesn't need a dealer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. Uh, a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, we'll, so we'll see how it goes. Good luck in the tournament. It uh, looks, I mean, there's a lot of talk about the over uh, about overlay in the event itself. Yeah, you never course, know, right? say 5 million guaranteed. I mean, obviously, you can enter all the way up until day two. Uh, I think it's a couple levels into day two, in fact. So, so you'll you know, have an idea at that so, point. Yeah. yeah, you'll have an idea. And, and there are a lot of people buying late. You know, a lot of people will sort of, if it looks like the day one numbers are low, they're going to get on the phone to their buddy and take, you know, I'll, I'll take 85% of yeah. you or, or whatever. It's and, a uh, staker's paradise if it doesn't get close. Absolutely, yeah, for absolutely. Sure. So, you know, y y usually that's why these guarantees – tend to find their own level you know they're they're not they tend to get bad. hit so, yeah i, th I, I so think so duffy might not get fired after all well and we had john, <laughs> well, we had john on and he's yeah. saying that uh many times he, he said that look our guarantees are aggressive they're gonna get they're not gonna get hit at some, some point of them, some of them yeah there will be a point be because one. because they're not shooting for that oh we're gonna get that no problem we'll, we'll right. tag that uh, guarantee just like there. marketing slang yeah. when it's when it's no, a guarantee you're clearly going to make this is the biggest tournament in canadian poker history yeah the five by million a lot. guarantee I mean, yeah, I by just, a lot i was just talking to our buddy wes wong about you know the second biggest tournament and and, and knew what it was probably that probably be falls view with like i don't know how many people did falls view get for 3k i, I mean, can't remember fat Back in the day, they had a yeah. big, a couple of big ones, but uh, I don't think. I don't think remember. Any... What do you think the second biggest poker tournament in Canadian? It would have been Falls View for sure. The yeah. WPT oh, back Falls in the day, yeah, yeah and, and it was day. a 10k back in the day. Right. But um, yeah, but this is this is this new is ground in, in the year 2017. Yeah. It's many fantastic. zeros. Yeah, well, many zeros. So hopefully, there, there's the guy with the Ross that <laughs> drops back. He ro Ross redeemed himself. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, let's get into some in case you missed it. He's missed it! How on earth did he miss that? Uh, in case you missed it, Kevin Hart, the comedian, the actor, has signed a deal with Poker Stars. He is vowing to make poker fun again. It seems like everybody is using the slogan now. Make America great again. Make your poker fun <laughs> make again. Make X, X make something X, y again. again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's vowing to make poker fun again. I really do believe in bringing people closer together. He said, I love the fact that poker is a game. We can take people all over the world, sit them down on the table, and give them the opportunity to engage, uh, to converse, to get to know each other, walk away with relationships. Uh, I, I think this is an interesting sign. And we talked about it uh, a few weeks back um, when poker stars stopped using Ronaldo and some of their other stars. Uh, right. Because they, you know, it's that diminishing returns. They, yep. They've been. You've gotten your value from gotten that your guy. value from the guy. They're moving on to Kevin Hart. It seems more like a, a move to the casual sort of player that uh, that they've certainly made a move to, uh, uh, you know, philosophy wise in the site. So, uh, what, what was your take on the signing? It's, it's certainly interesting because I can't think of the last time a high profile American was sought after by poker stars. I mean, with the Ronaldo and the Neymar signings, it was very clear what countries, what demographics that they were going after, you know, and they've done that in various places. But but Kevin Hart's going to be obviously, you know, yeah, he's an international superstar to some extent, but the United States, English-speaking world is... is kind of that wheelhouse that he's going yeah. so uh that that's i guess the only reason that it surprised me in that sense it's it means it's almost like a social media mining operation that they're yeah. doing right they just yeah. kind of strip mine move on to another one and and keep on going i think that makes sense yeah it's, 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 for sure it does. it's fair to say he's world famous at this oh point. yeah no no question about it. he's uh, he's a super big star uh, he's set to. But does uh, it is, is it more valuable than getting whoever like China's version of Kevin Hart is? <laughs> right, it might be right at know. this point. Yeah, and you know you looked at Brazil, another emerging market with uh, with Ronaldo, uh, Ronaldo as well. So yeah, it, it, you know they'll they'll keep on moving. We're, I don't know who the the uh, Chinese version of of that person is, but I, I can see them signing him soon. Yeah, uh, Hart is going to sign. Uh, he's going to star in a uh, televised cash game taking place at the Poker Stars Championship Monte Carlo. It's going on right now. Uh, up against Libri, Negranu, Jaka, and others. Which, is he going to be playing his own money in a cash game against like a bunch of professional poker players? I mean, that dude has a lot of money. So yeah, okay. uh, I think I, mean, I think when they're playing like a hundred k buy-in or something, uh, it's probably not a ton of money to him. When we were in LA, uh, 
Mike, when we, we were driving, he said that Kevin was playing at a game that he knew about. Oh, that, really? That same night, he said that he pay, plays in high-stakes home games in oh, LA. Oh, okay. our buddy Mike took us so to the... Won't to the be out of his game. element. Fair won't enough. Won't be out of his element. There's a high-stakes game going on right here. Oh, yeah? 100K What's buy-in. Okay. Um, and uh, Rob Young, who's hopefully is that on the later. big uh, the big table TV the big table, table up there? Up there? Yep. Antonio okay. Esfandieri, who uh, loves Canada, hopefully too, as much as he loves America, is there, and uh, some others, uh, Sam Trickett and and some businessmen as well. So, uh, good game going on over there. Um, it's just neat. That I hope the game never breaks so the Eagles guys won't play the tournament and be <laughs> softer pickings for us. Right? Uh, it's just I think I found it cool that you could just put a, a you know a tent. It's not a tent, but it's a, a, a big structure in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, almost and like all the big stars just show if, up. If you build it, they if come. If you build it, they will come. If you build it and you guarantee cool. five million, they will come. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. In case you missed it uh, this week, and I don't always love talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, but I thought this was <laughs> this one particularly was pretty interesting. And Poker News did a video as they do, um, and they interviewed Luke Schwartz, full flush. Uh, not sure. I know T, you kind of uh, tune out some of this stuff, um, but he basically just kind of went off and actually took the microphone away from Gloria Balding and started doing his own interview and just wow. teeing off on Doug Pope. Shots oh, fired. there are many shots fired. No question. Um, and, you know, I got to wondering, and, and there was a thread started in News, Views, and Gossip, and I'm thinking uh, some of the stuff that Luke said, his, that upswing poker, Doug's site is a scam, and he was going on and on about stuff. And I'm thinking, Ugh, like, do you really want to, you know, let this get out without any kind of rebuttal, without anybody kind of saying, wait a second, what do you mean it's a scam, that kind of thing? Because it's not a scam. It, Doug's training site isn't a scam sure you know and and for poker news to kind of publish that video is kind of i thought maybe they might you know approach it a little bit so he really just grabbed the mic first of all i didn't know that gloria balding still did videos but yeah poker oh i think it was gloria balding Uh, maybe was the name but yeah um so anyway i i wanted to get the backstory and somebody said oh doug uh, had taken shots at luke schwartz first and i thought okay well let me find out what's going on here and uh, seriously, serious. Who uh, who helps out Doug with upswing poker? He gave also, you the TL. Uh, he gave me the old TLDR. He gave me the the, the Coles notes. And here it is. So apparently, uh, a year ago or so, uh, Luke and Doug played head heads up eight game. Um, Doug ended up winning a bunch of money off him. Luke wasn't too happy about it. Um, and then the next order of uh, what happens in the next order of events is Doug. The whole bad reg thing happens with Jason Mercier. Sure. Where, but you got to understand that that. Jason, or sorry, Doug didn't call Jason uh, a bad reg. He had him labeled on his HUD right. bad reg. And, you know, people or saw a, that. I think a color that he typically was, yeah. associates that he uses, with bad right. regs. Yeah, so while he's doing his video, somebody sees that and goes, what, Mercier's a bad He didn't, like, Doug didn't go, Jason Mercier's a bad reg yeah, to the world. Yeah, he happened to have a color on his right. HUD. You know, so, so. Um, and, then, and then Doug takes to Twitter. This is last year, and he says, if anybody's interested in purchasing some Jason Mercier action, at, uh, in the 21k heads up at 0.95 cents tweet at me which is stirring that's the a, pot that's that's, that's, that's stirring definitely the pot. a little bit of a needle that is a needle oh, uh no luke shorts response says grow up you sad battle nerd waste of space duck uh so they get are, into are it on luke Twitter. and the jason homies or what's the <laughs> not, they're not pals <laughs> yeah i don't know uh it's... they take to a little bit of a twitter war where luke actually says something funny uh Doug says, uh, you up for playing 400, 800 ga- uh, again? Um, and Luke says, I'm busy playing Hearthstone in a pink vest and planning my next nerd convention, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was pretty darn good. Anyway, so uh, Luke, uh, he quits, and nothing happens for sort of a year. Um, and then he does the interview on Poker Life podcast with, uh, with Joey, our buddy. And he takes a bunch of shots at Doug as well. And Doug goes back and takes a bunch of shots at him. And uh, basically says that he's been a loser on Poker Stars for a long time, and all this kind of stuff. Like Doug wanted to, po- oh, Doug yeah. wanted to frame his graph, his uh, he did. Poker Stars. Oh, he did frame. Yeah, it? it's framed and <laughs> it's, it's like, behind him whenever he's graph. That goes wow, like, <laughs> it's behind all his videos. Wow. So they're basically taking shots at each other. But I mean, I think Luke just kind of went over the went over the edge here in this one. You know, saying stuff like, um, you know, Doug hasn't beat you know, uh, poker stars for two years and therefore his site is a scam and he's teaching people bad information. And I'm thinking, well, first of all, I think Doug's losses came at PLO and nobody would give him any more uh, action when they were playing heads up, no limit. He switched to PLO, ended up losing some money. And then Doug 
couldn't get action at his best game. Like he's that's what he's doing. Why would he go play a game that maybe he's not a favorite in anymore? So he decided to start upswing poker. This is what he loves doing now, and he's been doing it for a year and a half. And you know, for Luke to say, you know, there's lots of things that Doug can teach people that don't include playing the highest heads up no limit hold'em in the world. So right. I mean, if 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 the if you were only able to run a poker training site or teach people poker if you were like the best in the best in the world there would be, no be, <laughs> there be a lot fewer coaches in the world right now yeah right now. so um anyway i just kind of thought it was a bit offside and i wasn't quite sure why uh poker news would uh would allow that to go without sort of asking I mean, Luke a little it's bit more. good clicks it, it, yeah no, certainly it's it clicks. if that's what you're interested in absolutely that did a good job uh, all right, moving on. Uh, in case you missed it, uh, Tyler, uh, Taylor von Kriegenberg and Timex both took on the Deep Stack uh, uh, heads up bot. Never we, heard of it. What are you talking <laughs> yeah, about? Yeah, that didn't happen. Not us. What, what are you talking about? We got stack never. I don't know what Deep Stack <laughs> is. I don't even know it. So they ended up beating Deep Stack. Uh, I think Taylor beat it 4 nothing. Timex beat it 3 to 1 yeah. in their best of Made seven. Made it look easy. They, they crushed this is, us. This is what happens when you have actual people who play poker a lot. Play, play against instead the of bot. Maybe, podcast maybe, hosts? maybe we should have sent them in the first time. <laughs> but I mean, I guess like I guess the deep stack guys, the the U of A guys, were sort of doing like this, like the the you know when you play the video game, you know you get Glass Joe in the first right, level. Right, Glass Joe. You know, so uh, you wanted to build the confidence first, and then uh, and then they they bit off the more they could chew. They played some actual poker players. No, you, I mean obviously like we all know best of seven means nothing, or best of five, or we're whatever. going to the sample sample size card here, people. Well, I, I mean, I'm just saying that no, we I don't know. we don't even know that we don't, we don't know for sure that that Timex or or Taylor are our favorites over these things. I mean, right. they may well be, they may not be. Um, I think they are both available on Twitch the same way that our uh, horrendous defeats are, and the uh, same with the uh, the uh, Andrew Brokos and you Mavis sti- ones. Your statistical ties. <laughs> yeah, right. I think. Well, I, I, I mean, they were definitely statistical size. This whole thing is statistical tie. Let's go to sample size. That's our that's our defense. Uh, no, I thought it was cool, and and I wonder if there's a way for them to get a bigger sample size because you know they built this bot. They spent a bunch of time on it. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of interest in how good these are, um, how far we are, where exactly we are in this process yeah. because it has a r- ramifications throughout all. I mean, absolutely, they could just let it run. I mean, you played what, like 50 matches. You were you were in love with playing this thing. You played like well, a, a I bunch was, of matches. <laughs> yeah, I was slight winner over like 41. There I think you I was go. 21 and 20 or something. There you go. So, but I just thought it was cool, and and I think um, I'd like to know where we are. Yeah. In in regards to the best humans playing this I mean, thing. I think and that's I a good sample. Do. I mean, the fact, you know, you I I think overall if you if you put it against it's pretty strong and it's probably not going to beat the absolute best players in the world. It will definitely beat not strong players. I mean, I think that's that's where that we're at. Clear, you yeah. you played 40 matches, you were pretty much even up with it. Uh you're not a no limit hold'em specialist, but you certainly know what you're doing in the in the in the poker world. So, I mean, I think that's probably close to where we're at. Fair enough. Uh, moving on, uh, Matt Savage. Don't raise. You, you limp in there. <laughs> Matt Savage. I, I think it would be 2008 at. I think it might be a slight over It would crush, it would crush that Adam. Adam. <laughs> uh, we talked to, a few weeks ago about uh, Matt Savage and his social experiment tournament, uh, dreamed up by our buddy Scott Wilson. By the way, he he, he should get credit. Uh, this is the tournament where uh, they were not allowed to use sunglasses, hoodies. Headphones and most importantly, smartphones. Uh, yeah, while they were playing one. in the tournament area, that was the tough one. Yeah. Um, and uh, why don't we bring in Matt to get a quick uh, update on how it went? Matt, welcome back to the PokerCast. Good to be back. Been a oh, while. It has been a while. Let's talk. We uh, we had talked about the social experiment tournament. Terrence and I, of course, both love the idea. Uh, this is uh, making poker great again. We'll use that uh, slogan again. Um, and give us an idea. And I know you, you. This is you know you set guarantees in your tournaments, Matt. Sometimes you're pretty confident. Uh, you're fairly confident. How confident were you? You were going to make this guarantee. Uh, it did vary. Like at the beginning, you know, there was getting a lot of publicity and press, and I thought that you know that it would be easy. And then when the tournament started, we didn't have uh, very many players, so I thought that. <laughs> Uh, we were going to struggle a little bit, and then everybody came in a little bit late, showed up. I think a lot of people showed up later because they figured that uh, they wouldn't be able to use their phone, so maybe they wanted to get those last texts and uh, phone calls in before they started. Uh, but then we ended up getting 511 entries, so uh, ended up beating the uh, guarantee by over 50,000. So we're happy with that. 
That's really awesome. And did you get a sense of if the distribution of poker players in the, among those 511 players, was that sort of the, the, the usual group, uh, usual mix of pros and recreational player, or did it skew more pro heavy or more recreational heavier? Do you give us an idea of the demographics if you think they're any different at all? De definitely not pro heavy. I mean, there was yeah. a lot of amateurs here. Um, you know, some people were making bets on Twitter whether uh, the field was all over 50 or not, and, uh, you know, it was just calling it senior event. But to be, to be honest, there was a, a good mix of our regular local players and some people that had traveled in because they uh, liked the idea and they wanted to see how it would go. How irrational was the, uh, the hate for you uh, to, to schedule this thing? Were you getting some, some people uh, that were completely losing their minds? Or w w give, us a, give us an idea. Yeah, most, mostly from uh, you know, one of the biggest trolls on Twitter, Joe McKeon, who uh, basically you know, <laughs> came out and said that uh, he, you know, it's not fair that you would make people play without hoodies because they're cold. And the whole... The whole premise of the event was unfair, and, and uh, you know because it's their personal freedom. And I heard a lot of that, and, and he, anger, which was weird because it's one event, and people felt like, you know, how could we do this to them? You know, this is, you know, this is America where you're allowed to be on your phone and you're allowed to do whatever you want to do, and uh, you know that we were treating people unfairly. But you know, the simple bottom line is they didn't have to play it. They did and not. It was a one event experiment, and uh, it went off great for those that were here, and they really enjoyed it. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of hoodies is the uh, is is not in the constitution, <laughs> exactly. as far as I see. And you're allowed to wear a hoodie. You're just actually not allowed to have the hood part, the hood on, part on to cover you up. So you're allowed. You can so dress it's only up. if your head is cold. Yeah, you could. You could. Yeah, exactly. We, maybe you know. Maybe an allowance for a toque or a, <laughs> sorry, being America, a beanie, some sort of head protection would have been okay. Uh, Matt, I want to ask you about the pace of play. Um, did you did you happen to notice that maybe the play was any faster at all, or, or was it the same kind of thing with with people uh, kind of tanking and, and taking their sweet time with decisions, or, or did not having smartphones at the table uh, help that out a little bit? Well, we didn't have any clocks called, if that means anything. Zero clocks uh, in a whole poker tournament. Uh, yeah, is that is that common? In the whole tournament, but you know, the more or less people told us that they were able to pay attention and they were watching what was going on because, you know, they weren't looking at their phones. We didn't have anybody complaining about not putting antis in the pot like we do now these days. And uh, it was, uh, you know, people were telling us about different tells that they hadn't seen in some time. And, uh, you know, that it, it, was a, a, it was a good experiment. It was a good experiment to see not only if they could handle not having their phone, but uh, to see how others acted when they didn't have their phones. Did you have anybody pulling out an abacus and doing some math or maybe a pencil and some advanced <laughs> and, and algebra? School, like a how to play hold them uh, rule yeah, chart out of, their, out of their pocket? Did anybody have fun with it and, and bring some, a book? Like what did the, anybody? Oh, yeah. We had people with books. There was a guy reading a newspaper. I asked him what that was. <laughs> uh, he, was uh, he was good with it. Yeah, people were reading, and uh, it was interesting to see. You know, there was nobody taking notes, but uh, uh, definitely there was a different feel in the room. There was a lot more chatter. It was, the room was louder. Uh, people were laughing and having a good time, and I think uh, those that were here to uh, see the experiment loved it. Uh, eight penalties, I see, were handed out. Uh, that's probably 511 people. In a, in a tournament where you take away their smartphones, uh, eight penalties seems like a pretty big victory. I, I would have pounded the over if the line was eight and a half. <laughs> so would I. I would have too. But the thing is that, uh, you know, we, we ordered some extra security. We thought there might be some problems. No, we had no problems at all. Uh, everybody seemed to get along just fine. And the penalties that we gave out were pretty strict. I mean, you know, on day two, we gave away three penalties because people actually just had their phones out on the table next to them, and we had told them that they can't do that. Uh, and they'd been warned uh, throughout the tournament. So, you know, three of the penalties happened that way. But uh, also, you know, in the first day, we had our first uh, penalty happen to a guy that just pulled it out and just completely forgot that he couldn't have the phone. So we were pretty strict on it, and I think that, you know, other players at the table were supportive of, of that. And, you know, even the players that got the penalty said, hey, I deserved it. So uh, in the end, it was just a good, uh, a good experiment. So it worked out, uh, success. Uh, what about the future? What, uh, wh when are we going to run a couple of these again? Well, I definitely see us running another one of these. Um, I'm not sure when. Uh, there's probably going to be one during the LA Poker Classic again. I don't see us doing one uh, later this year. I just think that we want to make people hungry for it again. And, and although the people that played it said that they'd like more events to be this way, you know, maybe we'll do one in November, but for sure probably in the LA Poker Classic. And a 
And of course, I, we'd expect uh, another one. Look forward to a second, more successful one, hopefully uh, even more successful. But you, you got to wonder about the the more distant future, about if if you ever see a time, you know, down the road where a real major poker tournament, you know, the main event of some tour or something like that, would ever go uh, phone free. Uh, do you, do you see that within the realm of possibility, or, or, or is that ship just not even on the horizon? Yeah, I don't think so because I think the the people that would complain about the most would be the traveling pros. And, uh, you know, even though we didn't have a lot of those guys here, you know, we heard a lot of the feedback from them uh, through social media. So, you know, we wouldn't want to have that kind of negative feedback. We want to kind of keep that as local and, and friendly event. We know where there's a lot of recreational players and, uh, you know, they seem to really enjoy it. And I think that's the spot for it. I think that's the buy-in for it as well. Uh, you know, you guys have some events up there in Canada where you can't use your phones anyway. So, I mean, it's already in place in certain places. And I think, uh, you know, the public has spoken. They like to have their phones, but at the same time, I think they like this kind of thing as well. Well, we invented telephones. I well, mean, I don't yeah. know if Matt knows that. And basketball. But we, we, yeah, we invented phones. <laughs> Canadian, yeah, Bell. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, a couple of things uh, I really Bell want to talk about now, uh, Matt, is, uh, first of all, the Savage Invitational Golf Tournament's coming up in a couple of weeks. I cannot wait. It's going to be a blast. It's in Phoenix. What is there, 56 players? Uh, actually, 68 this year, so uh, you went a little bit overboard and uh, oh. you know, got a little bit more outside the bracket, but there's 68 players. Uh, happy to have you and Mr. Wilkes, and by the way, he deserves a shout-out. He's the one that first put that on Twitter about the, uh, having those phones at the table, so Scott Wilson, uh, if you're listening, for sure, thank you for that idea. It kind of spurred the uh, social experiment, but yeah, looking forward to the golf tournament. I've played four times this week so far and uh, looking to play a bunch more. I know you're getting out there as well, so... Uh, I, ha well. I haven't played for eight months, and you've stuck me with a ridiculous handicap where I have no chance, but that's okay because it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing everybody. I'm going to donate my money and, and have a great time playing golf. But Is it going to be weird? Everybody there is going to be skinny. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, that's the other thing. I got to get <laughs> the bet. The original bet was for my weight was I had to get under 200 by the Mad Savage Invitational. And you're already there. Or I'm not. I'm 201. So okay. I, but I've got a couple of weeks. And uh, if I didn't make it, I had to wear a shirt that said, I'm a giant fat ass on it the entire week. Now, the other person in the bet was the aforementioned Scott Wilson, who had to get under 205. He's a bit taller than I am. Uh, he had to get more, some more weight to lose. So he said 205 was his goal. I don't think he's anywhere near 205, Matt. So I'm hoping <laughs> you have this I'm a giant fat ass shirt on order along with the other. In a other, quadruple XL. In, a, <laughs> in poker player size. Yeah, it's already, it's already on order. And we're getting text messages from Scott every day. He's traveling all over the world and eating, you know, $1,000 oh, he dinners. And, yeah. uh, he's enjoying yeah. life and snicker bars and all kinds of things. And, you know. He it, just checked a, in on Facebook from a, a distillery in Kentucky. Going on, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, next thing I want to ask about, Matt, um, speaking of ingesting calories like, uh, like S. Wilson, um, there's a bet floating out there, and this is with uh, past S the Savage Invitational champion, Mike Nori, poker player, who has now – Terrence, listen to this. You, I don't think you know about this yet. He has been bet that he cannot eat $1,000 worth of McDonald's food in 36 hours. Okay. A thou let me say that again. $1,000 worth of McDonald's foods, no more than 200 of that can be salad. Right. He's got to eat in, th in a day and a half $1,000 worth of McDonald's food. He's getting five to one to do it. He's going to do it at the golf tournament. Uh, do you think <laughs> he can do it? Matt, first of all, do you think he can do it? Uh, I don't think he can do it. I don't think his mind is strong enough, first of all. Um, but he, for sure is going to give it, a sh give it a shot. And he's also going to wear a Hamburglar outfit, which is going to be great. I can't wait to see that. But, uh, yeah, Mike Norrie is a, a, a unique individual. Uh, the whole bet started off because he said that uh, we were paying too much for catering, and I said, well, would you rather cater $1,000 worth of uh, McDonald's? And then Michael Malley jumped out there and said, yeah, I bet you could probably eat $1,000 worth of McDonald's. And the next thing you know, somebody was saying, bet, bet, <laughs> taken off, Bill Zarian put a poll up there he got you know 50,000 votes on this bet and we did a radio show today out of Las Vegas so it's really taken off and uh, it's been an interesting uh, thing to see develop and uh, he's already conniving ways of adding extra bacon and uh, guacamole and sauce packs and uh, <laughs> anything he can do to try and squeeze in all this food in uh, 36 hours. Well that's the thing there's a way to angle this right when you go to McDonald's and you order 
So the first thing I thought of was, okay, I'm going to order a, uh, a quarter pounder, add bacon, add bacon, add bacon. It's like probably a couple bucks every time you add yeah. bacon. You add buy the, cheese. Buy the highest margin items for the, the add-on. Yeah, and that, then say yeah. no bun. Hold the bun or something. Yep. But the the bet uh, says you have to eat the, the uh, sandwich as it's designed. As designed. But you okay. can add on to it. So, But each quarter pounder is going to be a $20 quarter pounder. By the time he adds the uh, seven right. cheeses and a, and a couple of bacon, thirty dollars. Actually, he had it called the uh, it's called the Supreme or something like that. So oh, he already 20. figured out how to add all this stuff. So thirty uh, thirty dollar burger, thir- and and we need thirty uh, thirty three of them to get to a thousand dollars. Right so in thirty six wow. hours. Thirty six hours. So that's uh, thirty six. Terrence, wow, do you think hour. he can make it? Wow, that's I feel really like I could rough. do that. I don't think he can. I mean, that's one Big Mac. <laughs> Per hour with that, with like how many slices of bacon on it? Uh, it's a lot. That's, Several. That's that's a rough one. That's uh, a tough one. He's yeah, gonna. By the way, he's drawing dead in the golf tournament now because he's doing this before the golf. I tournament. mean, this this <laughs> this go, but this goes to what you, the concept that you and I have talked. You know, prop betting for advanced players concept, which is if somebody thinks that they can, if do they bet they can do they're it, they're usually gonna do it. Do it. Yeah. So you know, I, I'll t- I'll take it. I wouldn't lay, I wouldn't pay big odds. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry. Go ahead. I just think he's, he's, he's got no chance. He's got no chance. He's also got no he's chance got no in the chance. golf term after he tries it. So <laughs> that part I'm happy about. Uh, <laughs> thanks That's so much, true. Matt. Uh, appreciate your time as always. Yeah. Congratulations on the success that was the uh, the, tur- the social experiment tournament. Hope to see more of them in the future. Yeah, I'm looking forward to them as well. And uh, as always, thanks, guys, and have a good time up in Montreal. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. That was Mr. Matt Savage. Uh, let's roll on. Why don't we? By the way, yes. Switzerland. If if this prop bet were occurring in Switzerland, a a Big Mac costs six dollars and fifty nine cents in Switzerland. So Plus the add ons, a little bit, a little bit more live. Higher. Have you ever been to Switzerland? I have not been. It to is expensive it's as expensive hell. Place <laughs> it, is, it is ridiculous. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not surprised that's the most expensive Big Mac in the world. Yeah. There's. The, I mean, if it's a thirty dollar, and he can eat two hundred dollars worth of salad. So it really, he's yeah, only got. Want, I mean, the problem is that salad is very filling. Right. So you def- I mean, it's it's unclear whether, whether you really want. To, I mean, you're you're going to be in the bathroom a lot, a lot and yeah. regardless, <laughs> you're going to be eating cheeseburgers. Regardless of what particular toilet. method we're going to be using here, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I bet they don't have chili or something that would be like eight dollars. Like Wendy's has chili. You yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want to eat a thousand dollars worth of chili. <laughs> no, a, a a McDonald's in Monte Carlo. Yeah, that that'd be the place, right? Or the airport. It's always yeah. super expensive at the airport. The Swiss airport. There you the go. The Swiss airport. <laughs> Uh, moving on, in, uh, in case you missed it, Card Runners has stopped producing videos uh, for paid subscribers. Uh, really, an end of an era when yeah. you think about Card Runners. This is their statement: was starting June first, Card Runners will stop the production of paid video content and move a portion uh, of our library to YouTube. The website is in its current form will remain online for at least a few months. Uh, when you think back to the beginning of a video training, you really think. I, I think Daniel started a video training site early. Um, and, but Card Runners really set the standard off the top. The first one that really took off, the first one that made people think that this is a real industry, the first one that got Business. talked about in terms of, you know, is this a good idea? Is this quote unquote good for poker? Or why would you do this? And there, you know, much like sort of everything that's become a thing in poker in the last few years, you know, whole car cameras and televised and live streaming and stuff like that. Uh, poker training videos was one of the things that was talked about is like, oh, why would you do this? Why right. would you teach other people how to get better at poker? Um, and, of, and of course, now it's a, you know, it's, it's a very significant industry in poker because it turns out that, you know, it's, it's not, you know, making money at poker is not just about having it's really not at all about having some secret sauce that other people don't know about. There is no secret sauce. Uh, speaking of Big Macs. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck on the sauce. I, I know. Now, now I'm feeling a little it's bit of lost in the oh sauce. There's a Big Macs. Uh, yeah. uh, Donald's oh, still yeah. open? Switzerland. Uh, can I get to Switzerland? Um, you know, it's... it's th- Everybody sort of understands the the fundamental concepts. You know, thinking players understand what is game theory and and how do I use it and how do I how do I use uh, HUDs to exploit other players and how do I really think about games and iterate. And now it's you know recreational players uh, alike also use training sites because. Honestly, it's more fun to do an activity when you know what you're doing. I mean, you know, you get you guys know that I've been in mixed martial arts for a really long time. I'm not an expert on it by any means, but I'm into it. And it, the better I get at it, the more I enjoy it, right? Does that mean that, like, is if, if you know, we talked about, if George St. Pierre came down and gave me, like, a one-hour private lesson on how to fight, 
does does that reduce his edge in any way, really? No. Nope. Even if he puts out a video that says, okay, here's how I throw my jab, jab cross, double leg. Can you do it like him? Probably not, just because you watch the video. But you some have people to put would in say, that reputation. Some people would say can, now that people can defend it when they see him, you know, break down exactly how he's going to do that, it's easier to defend at that point. Uh, yeah, and I, I, but I don't know that's the case. Like, you, you still have to go out there and do it. And, and you know, as he's doing that, he's... He's thinking of the, ca you know, and, and MMA or poker, it's, it's, it's a game that's iterative, right? Like, I, I show you my strategy, you counterattack that strategy, so I have to have a counter to your counter. And I think every, every game is like that. And so, you know, we've gotten off a, li a little bit of topic, yes. which is, which is card runners uh, no longer producing videos. But the fact remains is that, like, in hindsight, nine years... I think yeah, they started in two thousand eight. Nine years later, it almost seems silly that we're 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 talking about the idea that this wasn't a good right. idea in the first place. It does, yeah. And I think so. The ones that I think about are Deuces Cracked sure. and Card Runners were big, really sort of in the day pre Black Friday. Yeah. Um, Daniel's also was was quite uh, popular as well. Um, but but when Black Friday hit. You know, we're talking about Taylor yeah, Kaby, who that's uh, huge. this is one of the reasons why we put him in the Internet Poker Hall of Fame was because he started Card Runners. Yeah, big success, uh, drove big a lot winner of, before that. But big yeah. winner before that, yeah. And, uh, and and you know, I think back to those those two. But since Black Friday, really, they I, I don't think there's been the the sort of care to expand that business like Card Runners as they had before. They can see that the fact that you know there's there's issues with online poker, whatever. Um, it and it takes a lot of time and energy, and maybe they found something to else keep to do. Producing new videos, and I think yeah. they got into the fantasy fo fantasy sports model or something. But I mean, they just you know moved on. Maybe to that's things. their they, new business. They're yeah, gonna make, well, make DFS training videos. <laughs> yeah, they learned uh, they learned you know a lot about how to run a business. I think from Card Runners and did quite well uh, as well. So, but yeah, I thought it was sort of a, a, an end of an era, and uh, um, you know, for those people who still have the uh, you know, if you're a Card Runners member, you should probably. Uh, download the videos to your hard drive because they might disappear at some point when the when the site stops, um, you know, being live. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for. In case you missed it, why don't we move on to 140 or less? It's 140 characters. That's it. I love hashtags. I love all of them. Terrence Chan. He's more than 140 characters to express himself. 140 or less. Oh well. Roscoe, you got one in there. Somebody sent this to me on okay. Twitter. John Jacobs. John Jacobs. John Jacobs, 1989, I yes. believe. The, and you might want to actually keep that in mind because you might actually have to look at the tweet to actually uh, to get why it's a funny tweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a video production now. so. Oh, that's right. We're well, going right. to put the screen cap up. Yeah. For sure. All right. Uh, for some reason, at Olivier Bousquet has grown a mustache. And has jumped into this 30 euro tournament. 30 pounds? 30 euros. 30 euro no, tournament. That's 30 pounds. That's 30 pounds. 30 that's pounds. a pound sign, guys. 30 pound tournament that I am playing. And the, the guy pictured looks like 2010 Olivier. With a porn stash. With a porn stash before he put on the, the, the muscles. Yes. For the MMA fight. This is. Uh, uh, but it does look strikingly like... It is remarkable. It's, it's kind of scary. Pretty amazing. I, you know, those of you who are listening on the audio version, we'll, we'll link that one up uh, in the show thread. So jump on yeah. over to show thread. That's a like heck of a is. porn stash. That is, that is an incredible a resemblance to, uh, to, to Live B. All right. The next one is uh, one of my... Well, my probably my favorite poker tweeter, and that is uh, nope, Matt Salzberg. The nut poker tweeter. He might wow. be the nut poker tweeter. Matt Salzberg. Uh, at, at M. Salzberg. Damn, Live at the Bike canceled my match with Hashtag King. Was looking forward to playing an unfunny, obnoxious a-hole. Want to step in, Joe McKeon? Wow. <laughs> Second Joe McKeon diss in the space of, what, seven like minutes on the show? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shots fired. Uh, clear, clearly they have a history there, too. But uh, in, I thought that was pretty good humor. Uh, all right, uh, we're going to take a break there. We're going to come back after the break. We're going to talk to Rob Young. Uh, about the uh, tournament that's going on right here, about the one that went on before, about the cash games, about the dusk till dawn, and and uh, Nottingham? No, it's not in Nottingham. It what? was. It was in Nottingham. It's in several different places. <laughs> <laughs> I keep tour. getting my English downs kind of. Uh, They've confused. got you rattled. The English have I'm you rattled. rattled. No, I'm rattled. Uh, all right, and then uh, in the third segment, we got a whole crap ton of emails to get to, uh, as well as uh, was Ross been playing poker? Do we have Roscoe report? Uh, is, what's is the the Chicago's today, or what are we doing? Um, you know, we'll we'll find something. Yeah. We'll get, we'll do, we'll dig some stuff out and uh, and get some hands in hopefully as well. Uh, you're listening to the Two Plus Two Poker Cast 
presented by RunItOnce.com. More right after this. Welcome back to the 2 Plus 2 Poker Cast, presented by RunItOnce.com. Uh, let's jump into the mailbag. And now... That right there is the mail. Now let's talk about the mail. Can we talk about the mail, please, Mac? I'm dying to talk about the mail with you all day, okay? Mailbag. Email number one. Before we get to email number one, oh, I have a, a question for, us? for you. I, I was oh, almost going to write in an email my own self. <laughs> okay. And say, uh, yeah, I want to get your opinion. <laughs> you're you're going to be like, uh, I, re- I really like the show, especially the main host. <laughs> So I'm on the flight to Montreal, and uh, as you, you know, I put my headphones in. I'm working, doing some stuff. Uh, take them out as we're approaching the landing. There's a, a nice French Canadian girl sitting next to me. We end up chatting. We do the, what are you doing and where are you from? But mm-hmm. you know, the normal thing. And uh, she tells me she's uh, an accountant, and okay. she's from Montreal. And I tell her what I, I'm, he- I'm here for, and she says, "Oh, well, while you're here, you're a gambler. While you're here, listen, trust me, you should be playing." Lotto Max in 649, the Canadian lotteries. And I said, <laughs> what? I, I said, what are you talking about? We have we have those in BC as well. No, but people are, all the winners always come from here because we have many more people that play the lotteries, so more winners come from here. Oh, my and God. And I had a decision at that time. I oh, had, my God. I had, she's an accountant, mind you, but I had 15 minutes to kind she of She does math for a living. <laughs> I had to think, do I spend the 10 or 15 minutes that no to explain it and she might still not believe me or think I'm, you know, uh, offending her in some way by telling her she's not right. Math is idiotic. <laughs> when she says something like this. Excellent drop. What's your play? Uh, uh, Do you just I, go, oh, I, I'll try I, that. I, I would nod my head <laughs> and and wonder where they're giving out accounting degrees. Nice enough girl. She's super nice. But, yeah, some, it, 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 the concept you know, just goes I, over I, I, I get it, too. You know, and it's funny. Like, I make the joke that she does math for a living. But, yeah, I mean, most – I mean, I – I went to business school. I know a lot of accounting majors. They're, they're like conceptually, it's so. Yeah. Gambling is hard. Yeah. <laughs> Math is idiot. Play the play the drop. Math is idiot. Yeah. I mean, wow, wow, wow. Mongolian <laughs> beef. Uh, <laughs> that was good though. I liked it. Email number one comes from Mr. T. Mike. Uh, fellas, for about a year, I've had my on my task list to drop you guys an email to thank you for the effort. Uh, with the poker cast, you guys are crushing it. I tried, but can't really think of anything to change or improve except for doing one poker cast every day. We can barely do one a week, guys. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say. We can do a 10 minute show at every day. I think I can handle that. That would be good. Just a Skype call. I'm going to share uh, quickly one hand with you guys, and it'll be nice to hear if you have ever faced a similar situation at a table. Uh, the, play, the hand was played in Mexico, where I spend my winners. The actual Mexican gambling law is from 1940 and doesn't apply to poker anymore, and all card games are left in the air. They're not illegal, but they're not legal. So this, ob- <laughs> so this obviously led uh, into the situation that the games on the casinos are not controlled. Games are published in, uh, published in private groups, and dealers are very inexperienced, pronounced bad. So the hand in a nutshell. Under the gun opens, button calls, big blind three bets. Under the gun four bets, button calls the four bet. Uh, at this time, after the button completes the four calls, the four bet, but the dealer drags all button chips into the main pot with antes before the big blind acted. Big blind five bets. Under the gun folds, <laughs> which is awesome. So he really dragged, weird. just to be clear on this, the yeah. dealer dragged the button's entire stack <laughs> in, into the main to pot. To the chips, okay. all of them. Uh, as the button didn't have enough chips in front of him and, and had his cards very well protected under a pile of chips. Wait, how would he have it under a pile of chips? I think before chips? that Oh, happened. before that. Yeah. Uh, so it's very difficult to see them. The big blind forgot, didn't know the button was still in a, in a hand and starts giving his cards to the dealer, thinking he won the pot. He was seat nine and cards didn't touch the muck and were not mixed in with other cards. He just passed them uh, a little bit over the betting line towards the dealer. Button starts shouting that it's a dead hand. Uh, third sign of an absolute hand strength after <laughs> flatting two times. Yes. Uh, and floor gets called to into a situation that one player doesn't have cards and the other don't have chips in play. 
what would your ruling be? Shit. Oh, wow, this is that a disaster. Is a doozy. That's um, a good one. <laughs> I mean, I think this, this, the errors obviously are are many, but they they have to go back to the point where the dealer dragged the button stack into the pot, <laughs> and at that point, you kind of have to stop the action and start reconstructing. You can reconstruct because you can reconstruct. You can at absolutely that point. because you know how much all the exactly. initial bets are for, right. and therefore you know how much should be in the pot and everything that isn't in the pot obviously belongs to the button. So Easy solution. That's the solution right there. That, that's can the start solution. The pot. But I mean... Now well, what about we, the cards that are gone towards... But they're not dead. They're not in the muck. The cards are absolutely not dead. They're live. Yes, they're, they're those cards are live. live. Yep. So we reconstruct the pot. We uh, hand the action, their hand the action would then proceed with okay. So after the big blind, so it, it should be the action should be on under the gun. Yep. Uh, and he folds and and then he folds and, and then, the button now has his decision, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And that should be pretty straightforward. Spoiler yeah. alert: the d uh, director confirmed with the dealer that this big blind hand was not mixed in with the other cards and was given his cards back. And the button was given the action. Ended up calling. Big blind shoved the flop and button folded. Uh, thanks uh, again. Listen to you guys every day while I work out, and it's usually my biggest motivation at the gym. Um, yeah, I think we've uh, solved that one. We actually solved one. I hope so. <laughs> Hopefully that's the correct answer. Email number two. Daniel writes in and says, Hey, crew, it's been a while. Have a serious question that I think could merit some discussion. Came up uh, a few months ago, but over the weekend, I spent too many hours watching Poker Night in America Twitch uh, because it's a train wreck, and I kept wondering about it. Uh, he goes on to ask, What happened to the sexual harassment, uh, intimidation, abuse, depending on how you interpreted them, allegation leveled against the Poker Night in America folks, and how did that story just go away? Uh, what would the impact on that story be on folks like Sean Deeb, Doug Polk, etc., and I guess y'all, given the trip to Montreal? Uh, I understand they're just allegations. They were also pretty detailed, pretty believable, and pretty much right in line with every mansplained away instance of sexually inappropriate behavior. I'm not saying we need to boycott Poker Night in America, but I do wonder how things like that just disappear from the discourse. As ethically concerned people, uh, and I get that not everyone is, uh, but you and T-Chan clearly are, how do you navigate that with the understanding that innocent until proven guilty, while a fantastically useful legal concept, is not a sufficient guide to this kind of question? Uh, that's it in a nutshell. This uh, LATB hand amused the crap out of me, so it might amuse you all, and he uh, sent us a, a YouTube hand on the limit, but uh, let's talk. Let's just talk about the Poker Night in America okay. thing, and we can uh, post the rest. Yeah, let's of the talk show about thread. that. Um, well, these things, you know, obviously they concern moral of people, and and Daniel clearly one of them. Um, and you, it can't if it's people have to move on in life. Like you can't just keep going o back over and over and over again on you know railing against somebody who we don't really know all the facts. Yeah, like we, we don't know if that's the this problem. actually happened or not. We that's, don't know exactly what happened. Yeah. So it's we're stuck in this stalemate of, did it happen? Well, it could have happened. It could have happened this way. It could have happened that way. Um, so we're, are we supposed to just, you know, every day get up and ask everybody what happened again? Like I, I, I was concerned about it. You were concerned about yeah, it. Absolutely. Clearly, we talked about it on the show. But um, to start boycotting people and, and doing all kinds of stuff without we really know what happened. It's that's yeah. I feel like you need sort of harder evidence to really go on about it. I mean, if it, the, you know, I think there's, I think Daniel is right that there that too many times in poker and in the world in general we forget about, you know, things that we should take a stand for, and uh, you know we forget about the transgressions of of bad things that are done. But this is one of those spots where we just don't know enough information. We yeah. don't know what's going on, and it's it's. Did it happen? It probably. Do we I know mean, what happened for sure? We I don't mean, know. and we don't know to what extent, and we don't really know. And I mean, you know, we we haven't had any further evidence. We haven't right. had any anybody else say yes. These people behaved in a manner that's consistent uh, with uh, Jacqueline Moscow's story. We haven't had anybody go the other way and sort of you know attack the character uh, you know of, of the accuser. We have we have literally no more information than we had at the time. Uh, and you know, and maybe and they as made poker amends to Jacqueline. As, yeah, as poker players, I mean, I think, and as people, you should you should sort of you, you know you 
you're presented with a situation, and then you sort of decide how you feel about this, and then as new information comes in, you start adjusting your 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 position on what you believe, and that that's sort of how sensible common you know that's common sense behavior is. We we literally have no new information about this. It might even be who knows. It might be like a legal case that is still brewing right under the under the scenes under the cover, and, and we just don't know what's going on right now, and nobody's talking because it is an active legal case. I mean that's a thing. If if it's something that lawyers on either or both sides have gone on and said, like, hey, keep your mouth shut until we figure this out, then, of course, there's not going to be any new, any, any new information. And maybe there is at the time. Uh, there will be at some point in the future. But for now, we just we can't. There's nothing to talk about. Correct. I agree. Email number three. Uh, James from Mississauga, 5,204 kilometers from Kells. That's an excellent start to this email. Adam, Terrence, and Ross. This email is about one month late, but wanted to share my experience in Alberta where I was able to watch Terrence's fight and also visit some of the local casinos. Me and my buddy were rooting hard for Terrence and yelling some, about some shit at Keegan when he came out, only to realize the two guys beside us had come here to support him. As a side note, given that the fight was in his backyard, almost everybody was there to support <laughs> yeah. him and not me. Crazy uh, numbers. Stupid numbers. They were nice guys, though, and didn't punch us in the face or anything. In fact, I told them that I was here to support Terrence because of the poker cast, and they recommended a local casino called Cowboys, which had some juicy PLO games running. Uh, we went the next morning, and the game sounded similar to the Edgewater Casino game. Ross frequents. Stakes are 125, minimum 100, no max. Uh, when I sat down at the table, I saw four to five regular or sort of four to five players with stacks between one and 3K. Everybody was straddling. It was a pretty nut. Pretty. It was pretty nuts. A few hours later. I drove to Edmonton for the first time ever and was surprised to see how many casinos were in the city. Even West Edmonton Mall had one inside it, but unfortunately no poker room inside there. I've never seen a casino in mall. I don't know. That's is, the first is that, one. Is that the only one you're aware of that? Yeah. I've never seen a casino inside That mall has a theme park. It, it has uh, an ice yeah, rink. Roller coasters. It has a water, uh, water slides and I think a wave everything. pool or something roller like that. Roller coasters. Yep. Uh, a few, uh, sorry, the, the, other two, the two other casinos we visited were Yellowhead and Century Casino. I was stunned at the game spread compared to Calgary. Yellowhead offered No Limit Hold'em daily and also a 5-10 No Limit, oh, sorry, 5-10 Limit Omaha High-Low split one, one day a week. Meanwhile, Century Casino offered Limit Hold'em, 3-6, and a 3-6 dealer's choice consisting of four fixed limit games, Omaha High, Crazy Pineapple, Regular Pineapple, and Hold'em. I was intrigued by this bizarre offering, especially at 3 a.m. on a Saturday night, and decided to join the wait list. There were actually two tables running. <laughs> Similar to wow. the Calgary PLO game, there's a lot of Asian players, but unlike the Calgary game, the age group seemed to be much older. Uh, the game that was mostly chosen was Limit Omaha High. Ooh, terrible <laughs> game. And occasionally, we get a regular or crazy pineapple game. Uh, the games were nowhere near as fun as Big Bet games, and I called it a night about an hour later. Yeah, uh, Omaha. Regular Limit pineapple. Omaha High is Pine regular pineapple is also terrible. Oh, yeah. like, even crazy pineapple is not that exciting. The limit. Yeah. I, I was uh, intrigued. Oh, sorry. My question for you guys is: What are the game offerings? Why are the game offerings so drastically different between two major cities, 300 kilometers apart? Uh, it's as if Edmonton is still in the infancy stage of poker, while Calgary is closer to majority. Uh, maturity. Uh, as always, keep up the good work. So I've got a bunch of experience playing in Calgary. Um, yeah. I thought this was a great question because it is. I mean, you know, not not all of us are, are, are Canadians, but uh, Calgary, Calgary and Edmonton, both uh, in the same province in Alberta, the, the two largest cities in Alberta. They're both kind of oil cities, and, and uh, they go through boom periods when people are making a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, so I, I am surprised. I, uh, you you do hear about a lot of wild and crazy poker action in Calgary, but not in Edmonton. Definitely curious to hear your take on this. So. Calgary has had the pot limit Omaha players for a long time. The, the game has been there for decades. So what happens is people learn the game. It's the most exciting game in the, in the casino generally. It's yeah, the biggest it's game. It's, uh, it's the biggest game. So people uh, you know, are drawn towards it. it. That wasn't the case in Edmonton. They didn't have that big PLO game. Like the Calgary game, people would come from Nevada. Uh, people would come from all over the world to play in that game back, you know, maybe 10 years ago. The game was really big and really good. Um, it's still a good game, but uh, it had a certain, certainly had a heyday. So that that Yukon, really Yukon Sam, Yukon Where's Sam, it? yeah, it, there uh, that game really kind of uh, shaped the culture of, of Calgary poker. I think um, I'd be interested to take get get uh, our friend Kelly Kellner's take because he's from Calgary and has played in those games. 
Wonder if there are any, uh, like other cities in the U.S. that there are kind of similar cities within the same state, and one has a lot of action, and, and one doesn't. One doesn't. It's just like you say, a history of the game. You know, part where it's kind of permeated the culture and penetrated the culture of of that city. Email number. Zero, zero, four, my jaws up on the low. Rocky Soil writes in from Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, 6,118,382 Stanley Cups from Kells. An excellent start to the email. Yeah, I mean, that's also Stanley Cups. approximately how many how many years the Canucks are from a Stanley Cup, too. So funny, <laughs> funny, funny, funny coincidence that way. Uh, he writes in, I've learned a lot from Davis Clancy's books and articles over the year, but his comments about mental game coaching left mental game coaching. Left me shaking my head. This, of course, in reference to our uh, poker cast two weeks Not ago. Tilting <laughs> is obviously better than tilting. I agree. In, in addition to that, uh, pieces of man, many other pieces of wisdom. In, in in addition to that one, he says, many players I know excuse a losing session or bust out by claiming they weren't playing their best, implying that if they were at the top of their game, they would have won or gone deep. A few sessions, Tommy Angelo, Jared Tendler, Elliot Rowe. Uh, to teach them how to play their A game more often would take away their excuses. If they know they're in the right frame of mind and still a losing player, they have no choice but to realize their A game isn't good enough, so they must get down to the hard work of studying and improving their fundamentals. This seems a much more common and likely scenario than, uh, than David's worry that a bad player will use a mental coach to avoid working on his or her game, which seems far-fetched and theoretical to me. Keep up the good work. Um, I think this is a great thought. I mean, I think... There is definitely a lot of excuse making, not just in poker, but but sort of generally, right? Like, uh, and and there's also a lot of sort of um, reconstructionist, revisionist history. Right. You know, when you play a hand and and you're just sort of like, oh, like. I really donked it off here. You know, I didn't get enough sleep, and I and I would never donk off in such a spot like this. But in reality, like, the person at the time thought it was a good decision. You know, maybe they reviewed it afterwards. I mean, I think there's definitely... There's definitely a lot of blowback from the Sklansky interview, and I think justifiably. I mean, I don't think I share David's... Uh, you guys know I don't share David's view uh, that, that mental game is largely irrelevant. I think Ugh. I think it's tremendously relevant. Um, but I, I do think Rocky Soa brings up a great point that, you know, a lot of the times people make excuses for not doing what they could, and, and this is potentially another one. It's just saying, like, I didn't play my best, or I didn't do my best, or, and if I was really trying, I would have won. Like, that, that's sort of like the most... Such a crutch. That, yeah, that, it's a, it's a, it's that crutch, and you, you see this sort of, uh, you know, like... You know, in, in sports, like imagine, imagine, you know, you've got you've got two kids who are in sports. Imagine if uh, one of your kids said, "Oh yeah, I would I would have stopped that puck," but you know, I just kind of I, I was just kind of not feeling it today. You know, you'd be like, "You got to get a lot of mentally tougher, kid." <laughs> that wouldn't wash. No, that wouldn't go. I agree. I I think uh, he makes an excellent point, and and we've certainly talked about uh, uh, David's appearance a lot, and um, differing opinions is, yep. is all that it comes down to. I want to get to one more before sure. we end the show. And this is one that was sent to you on Twitter. Yes. Um, and I'll read this out. If you want to hit the drop Roscoe for email number five, email number, it's number five. uh, Keve said writes question for the show, self-described casual fixed limit. Hold'em player. A couple times a month. Uh, I prefer fixed limit. Hold'em live. Uh, but three, six, and five ten have disappeared in my area. Don't want to play eight, sixteen, and higher. Lifetime slight loser with periods of positive run good. Only fixed limit game around I can afford is two, four, six fi fixed limit. Ugh. What uh, is two, four, six? Does that mean two on three the three blinds? Oh, I was thinking two on the, the betting, two on the pre-flop, two on the flop, four on the turn six on the river. That could be it too. I've seen I've seen weird games like that. I've you know I've seen like two, four, eight and stuff like that too. Uh, experience with five ten fixed limit Omaha eight or better, but not good enough to beat the regs. Oh, missed missed drop. I don't uh, know what it was. Lifetime slight winner uh, in an enjoy low buy and no limit hold'em casino don commits around seventy five dollars. Question: Move to one two no limit hold'em as main game. Uh, feel I could be a slight winner in future, but can't afford swings on teacher income. Goal is to have fun, but not gamble. Advice: Thanks. Okay, by the way, love the show, and especially uh, an occasional dose of fixed limit hold'em strategy or guests that you can have access to. I don't uh, think anybody's played that game here. <laughs> example, uh, Matt Herolenko or even stuff from Terrence. Uh, Terrence, so this is your right up your alley right here. Um, okay, so here's the thing. 3-6 uh, and 5-10 limit hold'em 
is a tough game to beat the Ray yeah. if everybody's if, if if you don't have some real incompetent people in there or you're just really really good at the game. I mean, like I think I could beat a five ten limit game, you know, in most places, but but it's but a tough game to beat. Much, right? Not yeah. for much, right? Not for much. Yeah, uh, just right. Now I understand. Definitely don't want to play bigger than that. So. Uh, the, you know, so the game around is two four six. Um, if I'm right, by the way, about it being four on the turn and six on the river, then there are some strategy considerations yeah. in there. In that drawing you know, gets better, your draws are going to go up in value because it kind of uh, you get a better price on the river. So sometimes there's going to be, especially multi-way pots, are, you're going to be like correct to call on the turn with a gut shot, which is not something that typically happens in multi-way. Uh, fix limit hold them. So yeah. Uh, so the question is between I guess playing two four six limit hold them, five ten oh eight, which he doesn't feel he's good enough at to beat the regs, or to play one two no limit. And my sort of thought is probably play one two no limit. That's what I was. It's say. the it's the most beatable game uh, with the you know the the rake. The rake is actually. I mean, one of the things about the rake is that it's in 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 cash games where the rake is capped. It's a lot. the The effective rake is lower because what you're going to do is you're going to have a lot of very small pots where somebody just takes the blinds, or the pot is finished on the flop, uh, or the the hand is finished on the flop, and the pot is relatively small. Or you're going to have very large pots where the rake gets capped, and therefore it's a much smaller percentage of the pot. So even if it's say a 10% cap up to five dollars, if you've got a $1,200 pot, you know five over 1,200 is much less than the actual effective pot size. Uh, uh <laughs> cap. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was actually you talking or if it was a drop. Um, so, so my thing is, yeah, learn to beat no limit, hold them. I mean, these, you know, oh eight's going to be around for a while. I mean, limit hold them also is going to be around for a while. But the the fact is that more and more people play no limit every day. Yeah, I uh, I totally agree. I think one two is the way to go for them. Uh, but you know, it's a one. They're different games. Like, is it yeah. something that you're going to enjoy? Right. Well, that's well, we talk about swings. So another thing. Sorry to interrupt no, you, but but right. he, he sure. said say you know he can't afford the swings on the teetering up. So th there's a definite misconception that no limit is swingier than limit. That's completely false. Um, f 08 is a little different because the split pot uh, lowers variance. But actually, no limit hold one two no limit is a smaller game most of the time than 510 fixed limit as long as you don't have yourself a lot of money on the table. Right. If you're about 100 big blinds deep or less, it's probably actually a smaller game than 510 limit. And so and especially if you don't if you're allowed to buy in in this game for $80 or something like that, you're allowed to short stack it. It's actually smaller variants and one of the big reasons is that when people get it in with crappy hands, you're going to have a much bigger favorite. So, you know, when you're up again, when you've got a set against a flush draw, when you've got top pair, top kicker against top pair, other kicker, you're a very big favorite. And so, um, you know, the fact the fact of the matter is, you know, especially if you're allowed to run it twice, the, yeah. the variance is much lower in no limit hold'em than it is in fixed limit hold'em of equivalent, approximate equivalent buy-ins. All right, agreed. That's uh, that's going to wrap up the show. This is going to be our first video podcast. Ho hopefully, we'll do some more. Uh, had a lot of fun. I thought I we were doing an interview. Oh, we are. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <It's all> right. <laughs> I thought we were going to. I thought for some reason we jumped a third segment of doing it. No. Sorry. We're going to do uh, a little interview. Yeah, we're going to do uh, we're going to do the interview after the break. So you're listening to the Two Plus Two Poker Cast, presented by RunItOnce.com and Poker Vision and PartyPoker.com this week as well. Oh my goodness, there's a uh, lot of that. More uh, right after the break. Welcome back to the 2 Plus 2 Poker Cast, presented by RunItOnce.com. Uh, we're now joined by uh, Mr. Rob Young, who uh, is behind many things in uh, English poker and and uh, party poker, a lot of the la tour. We talked to John Duffy a couple of weeks ago. Uh, first off, Rob, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. I listened to the uh, the podcast with John, and uh, kind of like what John says, and uh, he always just says it the way it is. Yeah, he's good with that, isn't he? He's really good with media. He hates people in suits, and he mentions it on every interview. So, right. <laughs> Can't wear a suit around him, or you get in trouble. Like, that's for I, sure. I don't even know how to put one on. So I, I have one. I have one suit. It's yeah, for, for weddings and funerals. for weddings and funerals. Yeah. yeah, that's my that's my suit. Poker, most poker players are the same, I think. Uh, we pulled Rob out of uh, the big cash game. The hundred thousand dollar buy-in uh, has been going on for the last couple of days. Uh, is it going on all throughout the the series? Is, what's the schedule? Um, well, I think Antonio and uh, Sam arranged it. I think Antonio might be having a day off tomorrow, um, but uh, 
kind of happy to play if anybody wants to anybody jump in wants and to play. play and jump in yeah what's um, the uh, what's the lineup been like so we uh, sam trickett antonio yourself uh who, who else is jumping in there i know people would like to hear. Uh, jeff gross jumped in today and uh a bit of an advantage when he's seen all the hands from yesterday <laughs> kind of weird but uh uh, there was a really nice lady called uh, Lauren who plays high stakes in Vegas, and uh, a few other guys uh, who play locally in sure. locally in playground. Um, the, guy, the, the guy who won yesterday didn't play today. Uh, he, he skimmed me alive yesterday. Um, <laughs> Oops. I was kind of looking forward to playing him again, but uh, and it was an interesting game. It was a bit more passive today. Um, I think that uh, Antonio played like really really well yesterday. I thought I'd sort of riled him in the first like 45 minutes, but uh, once he made me lay down the aces to his check raise on the river, he kind of gave me a good spanking, to be honest with you. Did he show you the bluff, or did he have it? Uh, no, he had a seven. Uh, he had a flush draw, missed it. And uh, I bet, like, I bet really bad, because I bet like 10k on the end. I disguised my hand, and uh, I bet 10k, hoping he'd raise to 30 make a move and he made a move and then suddenly I changed my mind and persuaded myself to pass so it was like <laughs> really bad really and like I had another hand where I was repping a 10 against him on a 10 10 5 board uh, he had ace 5 he came with 5 again I played a 10 like I would play a 10 and uh, I bet 50k on the end and uh, it took like 4 hours to make a decision um, and threw the 50k over to me and unfortunately I had like six high or something, so uh, <laughs> so yeah. it was a bit of a tough session yesterday. Uh, today started off tough. I was like 150 down. I did some crazy bluff into a flush when I was trying to represent the flush. <laughs> <laughs> Thought she had a pair, so, so she couldn't have a flush, and uh, did like 125k in that hand on that bluff. But uh, battle back. Kind of battle back. I hit a couple of hands like ace jack, hit straight, and uh, just kind of bluffed away like won like a few 20k pots and managed to creep back i think i won like 80 or 100 today so i'm like down 50 over getting there over the first few days but kind of like doing these cash games at these festivals i think it's something different and uh you know it advertises the event it's interesting i think i'll be honest with you watching tournaments is like watching watching paint dry sure. until it's the final table so i'm really keen for sam to help out sam's a global poker ambassador for body poker help arrange these games we have big games in russia we have big games in uh, king's casino in rosvidov so we're kind of getting like really big games in each of these millions festivals so you want them to drive your traffic in the early stages of the tournament well i kind of like it i mean you can pr the tournament makes people people see the stream they see the, the venues gets a bit of a buzz before the main event starts and uh, makes makes maybe it means people like myself and Sam we come a little bit earlier mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to be a theme o originally we were going to call it the, the party book and millions cash game when everyone sat down with a million yeah. um, I think then we decided like it was a very limited audience <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think they dropped it to 100k but I think like, that's that's like fine um, made for good TV and made a lot of fun to play in yeah and I was sort of seeing some of the comments on the on the threads and people are like, insulting us all uh, so i think this is a really good idea and something that i'd certainly like us to do at all festivals i mean i'm all for the recreational players and the lower stakes but i think you know pl players watching these types of games would aspire to get into them so i think it's sure. a, i think it's a, i think it's a good thing and i think uh we're certainly going to be pressing the high rollers the 25k buy-ins at these festivals in the future so hopefully we'll get more people come in at this uh, this high stakes level and make it a little bit more a little bit more interesting cool i want to uh, get to the festivals in a sec but um first off i want to just educate our listeners a little bit about uh yourself and dust of dawn and nottingham uh give us an idea there's a famous story of course that you uh, and your buddy went to uh a poker club and they were closed down or wouldn't let you in or something and you said screw this we're going to open our own place is, uh, is that true no, my best friend's a guy called nick whiten who's the operations director of just or dawn uh, he does all the logistics and operations for the events that we're doing out uh, around the world and, and at the club and literally we used to go down to the casino and pay 20 pound rebuys on tuesday thursdays and uh, sunday nights been gambling in the casino since we were 18. they had a new man put a new manager in place 
we like got stuck in traffic. We're one minute late. We walked in and they said, "You can't play." And I said, "Well, I've been gambling here since I was 18. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. Sorry, you can't play because obviously they were they didn't want anyone to late reg because they want everyone in the poker game so they can do their money on the casino." So we kind of drove back, no poker for the night, and uh, Nick said to me, "Why don't we just open our own poker club?" And uh, <laughs> it's kind of weird. Just as we're driving past, we drove past this huge place called Simon's, Smiling Sam's, which is like a huge warehouse thing. But it said, for let. <laughs> and I said, yeah, what about that place? It's a sign. And then we were kind of just joking, really. And then the next day, I rang up the agent. And the agent, the, the actual landlords, were one of my clients in one of my other companies. And uh, they offered for the first two years, first to have... Uh, Instead of paying six hundred thousand a year, they get offers to pay three hundred thousand a year, and then the next thing we were building a huge poker club with no license. <laughs> and like, I kind of thought we'd we'd bluff the bluff the authorities. There was one license left in the UK, and I thought, well, we're never going to get a license because we've got no experience. So let's build the casino, build the poker room, employ all the staff, and bluff them. They have to give us a license. And uh, we ended up in court for two years. <laughs> I ended up with 50 staff on the payroll. <laughs> that I had to pay before you opened. <laughs> before we opened. And like we were like three, four million down before we even opened, wow. the, opened the club. But like, in, in the end, we were getting bullied by three big companies, LCI, Grosvenor, and, uh, and Gala. They all clubbed together, put their legal fees together. Uh. They all put in like 150K each to try and stop us opening. And like... Everyone said, just don't bother. But we'd already built the place, so we had to go through with it. And we won the court case, and we got granted the license. And then, for some reason, we ended up in the poker business, <laughs> which was a complete accident, literally from one flip and comment. Yeah. Uh, and me and Nick joke about it, that, you know, that's a real expensive comment. Um, yeah. And it was really just meant to be a hobby, for a place for our friends to come and... We had other businesses. It was just meant to be. We had a bar, a football club, and a casino, which yeah. were our lot making businesses. And then we kind of started to do bigger events. Simon Trumper uh, was, was, was there from the start and was very ambitious. He wanted to do poker the right way. Um, I didn't really understand structures and all this sort of stuff, but Simon did. And then things just evolved and I kind of didn't think I'd do it for that long, but then every year, some like, big project came up. Like we had the Wem- I was going to quit. Remember the I, the Wembley Stadium tournament? Yeah, I was going to quit, like after and, and do something else. And then the Wembley the Wembley came up, and then Caribbean came up, was, and then I just just end up getting more and more in the hole with this business. Um, and then it was a freak situation with Party Poker, where. We had WPT at Dust Till Dawn, and I met the managing director of Party Poker. And he said, like, could you come help us with our poker business? We don't really know much about poker, mm. which is be, if being honest. And then we got involved with Party Poker, and then kind of just ended up Here totally, we are. totally by accident in a situation where myself, the staff at Dust Till Dawn, and the staff at Party Poker, we're kind of all in this crazy project now. Yeah. I mean, there isn't really a lot of right <laughs> rationale behind it, <laughs> you know, the, um, and we suddenly find ourselves in a situation where I think we're going to guarantee 50 million this year in live events. Wow! We're pretty much sure we'll do 100 million the, in 2018, and we're just all a bunch of friends at Party Poker and Dust Till Dawn that are just all involved in some mishmash of a project, <laughs> and we have all the players encouraging us, saying, "Go on, go for Let's it." Do it. And, so there's, it's just like it's not anything like well thought out. I'd mm. like to say it was well thought out, but just uh, just find ourselves in this situation. I mean, we don't really have like a hierarchy or any like major right. major cute planning. Right. We're just putting massive guarantees on and see what happens. Just put big guarantees on online and live. Everyone works as hard as they can. Launch an event, bodge your logo together, <laughs> send an email out, and uh, <laughs> and I think. I think this approach has kind of grabbed a lot of the poker community, and uh, I think that's that's probably what would would, would keep me interested. Different sure. players were willing to support this project. 
Yeah, I want to ask you, Rob, um, you know, in the United States and, and in Canada to some extent and to a lot of places, poker rooms are sort of considered not a great revenue income. It's just something that you draw people in so that they'll play table games or lose money in other ways. But, you know, what are the sort of challenges in, in running a, a successful poker room that, you know, can actually be, a, you know, can actually make money on its own? I mean, how do you how do you draw that and how do you do okay. that? And can poker can be its own successful business? As well, a, the only way to make for profit playing poker is if you do it like in, in a jurisdiction where you're not paying the tax mm. you know, because the overheads and the, the dealer costs are so high so like here yeah that's the only sustainable real way to make a profit on live poker there's no money in live events I yeah mean, like we did the Caribbean last year you know we spent like I think it's 1.3 million sterling just to do it you know, it, 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 there's no money in live poker uh, there's two ways to make money in poker Num the first way is to be not paying tax, so mm -hmm. effectively that increases your bottom line by 20%. But that's going to finish eventually yeah. for everybody in the world. Everyone's going to pay tax. But the second way is to own the live and the online. So if you own the live on, on the online, you can kind of step back and say to yourself, okay, I'm happy to invest in online, grow my customer base. So invest in live, grow my customer base, and then I've got one customer spending two revenue streams with me on live and with me online then it's possible to make to, to make a small profit but not significant maybe and, and, and again you know just, just going back to the strategy of your party the strategy of your party is to invest in live as a loss leader grow their online base and spend money in the poker community it, it really bamboozles me how like uh, you see like 888 and these companies just blasting TV. And no offense to you guys that are into TV. I'm talking about TV that's outside the poker community. Because let's just look at the maths. Say you've got a, a marketing budget of 20 million. If you're going to spend that money on Sky Sports, that 20 million is out of the poker community. Right. You're taking the players' spend and you're taking it out of the poker community. I just don't know why people just don't give 20 million to the players or, do, or give 20 million to companies that are within the poker community. Mm. Then that 20 million stays in the ecology and poker can survive. And that is very much the business strategy of, of Party Poker now, is to say, forget this advertising, £10 free for a million on the best sports channel. It's let's take that money and let's spend it with local suppliers who are within the poker community and let's spend it on bonuses and rewards for the players. Then the mass can add up for poker. Makes the maths don't add up when you pay Ronaldo 14 million or whatever for four, two, three year contract. He just goes and buys uh, six more mansions and ten more Ferraris. The money's out of the community. Hmm. Is the argument, though, that if you only spend within the poker community, how do you attract new players, like people who are, don't already play poker, like you know you and I and Adam, how do you bring in the, the quote-unquote casual market? Well, this casual market is something that that has been quoted and this word recreational player has been quoted so much and I don't believe in it you know the poker community grew in the old days by me playing I said to Nick this is really good thing called poker do you want to come and he come and we grew it ourselves I, all these articles that have been written by these so-called experts about we need to do all this advertising to get the fish in to get the recreational player in spin and go this that I don't buy into any of it I buy into the poker is naturally a community based business and if people have a good experience they tell their friends they see their friends on the stream some guy wins a million it's a, you know, it, life changing money and the poker community grows goes that way so I'm just not a believer in I mean if you look at the attrition rates say someone advertises on television just a 5 million campaign a hand of those players are still playing in a year's time so I just don't like agree with anything that any of the poker businesses do. I, I think back to, remember when PokerStars started and then they started PokerStars.net? And they thought, oh, we'll sign all these people up to free money and we'll be able to convert them over and here they come and they're going to flood the games. And the, the conversion rates were so minuscule mm. that they realized uh, a couple of years into it that, wait a second, <laughs> these people that play for free aren't people that end up playing for money generally. So 
it, it's sort of that similar thing where you're going after this group of people that maybe don't have a... They're playing poker for completely different reasons. Different reasons yeah. than other people are, and you're spending a lot of money to get them. I came from the casino, I was playing blackjack, and I saw the poker room, wandered in, and looked what everyone was doing. I mean, yeah, I just think uh, these guys in suits and these boards, I don't think they know what we're talking about. I think we should keep all the money in the poker community. For example, when we go into Russia, I said to Nick, I said, Nick, let's use Gypsy King. They're in the poker community. Let's use them for advertising. The money filters back down. Let's, wherever possible, use media that are in the community. Let's not use pay agencies and pay people that, that suck money out of the, 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 the community. Hmm. Now, this is a radical... People think this is a radical way of doing things, but... I don't think it is. It's like when well, we got this Powerfest event on, on Pledge Poker, we're guaranteeing 20 million. It was like two and a half million 18 months ago. <laughs> so, okay, there's a chance we'll drop 5 million on it. But if we if we advertised on television on a 5 million program, no one would blink an eyelid. They think that's good business. If we overlay 5 million Powerfest, everyone's going to say, are these guys crazy? Yeah. And for me, that 5 million goes back into the community. Everyone plays each other. It gets raked around. You know, so I think poker is a, is, is a unique industry, and it's a very good question that, 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 you, know, that you asked there. Um, Let's talk about Party Poker Live, and, and this is, uh, you, you mentioned it, it's uh, yourself and some friends who are who are really taking the poker world by storm, and no, everybody's talking about it. I mean, the, you know, the guarantees you're putting on tournaments are fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, you look at Sochi, in, place, in places where, you know, we haven't had the, that kind of guarantee in the past. You've just come from Nottingham at the Dust of Dawn with the <laughs> with the big guarantee, um, million, yeah. yeah, and and uh, and we've got one here, uh, five million guaranteed, one million for mm -hmm. first. Uh, I know there's some nervous people, I'm sure, the day before uh, to counting up all the entries, but it sounds like uh, you're gonna you're gonna hit the entry as well. We don't need to be nervous because if we drop money here, say we drop 500k, it's going back into the poker players' players' pockets. Right, right. If we'd advertised on television for 500k, everyone would be going, aren't they doing a great job? Hmm. <laughs> Shouldn't, the only reason to have a worry about missing the guarantee is if you can't afford to pay it. Right. <laughs> uh, the one I was interested in, though, was... <laughs> <laughs> I hope, as somebody who plans to play the tournament, I hope, I hope, I hope the money's... <laughs> Simon Jump has got a bag, an overlay bag. Oh, All does right. he? Good, He's got good, a big good, bag. Good. Here you pick you out of the corner. The I'll put you in the tournament. <laughs> Honestly, overlay is not a bad thing. It's added value. Sure. As long as we don't double spend, you know what we what we cannot do on this project is go crazy sponsoring sports superstars and taking. We, we've got to decide where we're going to spend our marketing money, online and live. And everybody is on board in party poker, in Dust Till Dawn. All our partners, and we've got some great partners. Everybody's all on board. Let's spend money within the poker community. Mm. Nice. Let's, okay. Let's so book the trends, you know. And I think another good principle that that everyone is on board with is that party poker is in a unique position. Let's look at poker stars. Poker stars, whatever, one billion turnover. If they give an extra five percent to the players, yeah. there's fifty million off their eBay. Or is it five million off their eBay? 50. 50 mil off the rebit, yeah. Share price down. Party poker has been so screwed for five years. Party poker can afford to go for high turnover, low margin, mm. and make more rebit and be a more valuable company. So it's a very, very interesting opportunity for party poker to accept a lower margin, give a lot more back to the players, and put something back into the game. And, 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 and I think that's why. That's why this is an interesting project. We're actually able to do things the right way. And it's a good company to do it with because their brand has been so strong for a long time. It's not like you're picking a, you know, whatever party, you know, whatever poker.com and trying to spend the money on it and build it. Party Poker has a long list of people who have, you know, played for a long long period of time, good software. So, you know, what it's... What did you say good software? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's... There's, uh, there's certainly a, a playability about it. I've, I've played... It's them definitely improved. But I don't think any of us can sit here and say that, you know, the benchmarks to PokerStars, it doesn't, you know. Sure. PokerStars is a world-class company. And I think a lot of people say to Tom, the manager to play poker, do this, do that. Everyone needs to be a bit, a little bit patient to... to hmm. Everyone's like, you know, everyone you meet wherever the world at the moment, they'll say to Tom, they'll say to John Duffy, they'll say to these guys, you should do this, you should do that. And, like, my answer to everybody is, you know, Party Poker was a company that was declining 33% year on year for five years. 
it's growing rapidly now. Hmm. It's got, uh, and you don't run before you can walk. And everybody be patient. The software will improve. The live events are going to be amazing. The customer service is diabolical. Was Tom will improve that. All these things will improve. And over the five year period or whatever the plan is, there won't be much difference between the competitive the competitors between stars and party poke as well, I believe. Good. I think you'll have two I think you'll have two big online companies and that's gotta be good for the players. That neither company, Party Poker or Poker Stars, can start dictating to us. Right. So let's talk about the tour. We're going to we're here, then we're off to the Caribbean with another five million guaranteed million for first. I think they're all five million, they went out. Yeah. Um what's the tour go? Um Actually, we've got Soshi first. We're back to Soshi, Soshi for, yeah. for a 10 million festival, 5 million for the main, wow. and then 5 million side events. I think pretty much everything's going to be 10 million now as a festival. We tried the format at Dustle Dawn and at 9 million in Sterling, so I don't see a problem with us doing $10 million in these areas. Uh, and then we're up to the Caribbean. We booked the whole hotel, the whole resort. We didn't mess about. We just booked the whole thing out this time so we can <laughs> control it. We can't control the weather, but wasn't really happy about Punta Cana last time, the hard rock, because we couldn't control the cash games and give people the best experience. So uh. this time we just booked whole hotel, all facilities. We got all the staff from the media hotel uh, to help us. So we're gonna, it's going to be a real community event. Obviously, we, we will be in the hole for 10 million for that event. Wow. Are there some specific uh, dis difficulties with doing a tournament in Russia? So, you know, you think about the... Well, there is if you don't. If you try and do it yourself. <laughs> yeah. But we have a uh, really close friends of ours, known him for years, and a uh, guy called Artu, who is basically Mr. Russia. He used to be chairman of the Russian Federation of Poker until Putin closed it down. And him and his company, uh, PCM, they pretty much run all the live uh, poker in the uh, in CIS in the Russian countries. And we've, done, we've agreed a five-year partnership with, with his company to work with him. So... You can't go into these countries and just expect to waltz in and, and do what you want. You need to work with the best partners. And again, that goes in line with our policy to invest and spend our money with uh, within the community. Fantastic. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Good luck with the tournament here. Good luck with the tour going forward. Uh, and uh, hopefully in the cash games, the big cash game in the next few days. Uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, certainly... If you ever want to speak to a bit more about party poker, uh, Tom Waters, the MD, he's probably a good guy to like speak to a little bit. Probably, probably knows a bit, a little bit more than sure. me. Sure, sounds great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, we got a bunch of thank yous to do. That was uh, that was a fun show. Video yeah. uh, video seems to go well. Hopefully, we didn't break the uh, cameras or anything like that. Well, <laughs> I mean, um, I wore the right makeup. I don't know about you. <laughs> you did. I'm not sure if there is the right makeup. Cocoa maybe. butter. <laughs> Uh, we've got a bunch of thank yous going out. Uh, thank you, first of all, to uh, everybody at Party Poker and Poker Vision, Mr. Kelly Kellner uh, and Aaron, our uh, video guy. Thanks so much for you guys. Thanks for, to uh, Matt Savage for joining us uh, in the first segment to talk a little bit about his his, uh, his tournament and uh, you guys for uh, making the flight out here. Much appreciated, and everybody at home uh, yeah, listening. And, Jump uh, in on the forum. See, I have a camera. Time. I have a camera to look into now, so if you're watching this on Do video, it like uh, Ra Macho Man Savage or something. Yeah. Macho Man Savage. Oh, yeah, you better get on the PokerCast oh, forum and snap forums. into a slip gym. <laughs> uh, PokerCast.2plus2.com. Send your emails in. We got to as many as we could this week within the time constraints yes. that we got. We're going to bounce uh, out a bunch more. We say that every week, but we're, we promise we we'll get to your emails. We we try not to miss any. We have a backlog, What's which is great. What's the best deal you're going to get? Oh, nice. Go no Country, my favorite movie. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks, everybody, and we will talk to you next week.